everybody back from the break for this session on the future of data, privacy foundations, and legislative approaches. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Stu English, Chairman of Venable, to uh, moderate this session. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dustin, and it's good to be uh, with all of you. I've got uh, the great privilege of uh, moderating a very distinguished uh, panel. I will briefly tell you who they are, but then I will let them tell you more about themselves and their perspectives and kind of what they're bringing into the privacy debate right now. And then we'll engage in kind of a good, good back and forth among the group. So uh, in the order that I have on my list, um, which I, I will say to Marty, who I've probably known the longest of all the folks here, we'll put the least important first after me. Uh, Marty Abrams, the executive director of the uh, Information Accountability Foundation. Uh, Jennifer Huddleston, the director of technology and innovation policy at the American Action Forum. Peter Wynn, the acting chief privacy and civil liberties officer for the U.S. Department of Justice. And Jane Bambauer, professor of law at the University of Arizona and the reporter for the Uniform uh, Law Commission. Uh, which is very engaged in this issue right now. So uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, why don't we uh, dive in? Marty, tell us, uh, tell us what you're doing these days on privacy and, and give us just a little bit of an intro. So um, uh, I'm Marty Abrams. I have been doing privacy for over 30 years now um, and have been doing that pri privacy work globally. Um, uh, I run the Information Accountability Foundation which was the incorporation of the Global Accountability Dialogue, which um, defined the concept of accountability that's being built into many national laws. Um, and we look at the question of how organizations can, can have uh, the freedom and flexibility to use data wisely, while at the same time protecting individuals from, um, um, from, from negative uh, outcomes from both the processing and not processing of data. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Marty, and welcome. Uh, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. My name is Jennifer Huddleston, and I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation Policy at the American Action Forum. Broadly speaking, my work covers the intersection of law and technology, which of course includes the issue of data privacy. And I've written a lot about the different ways that state laws um, may be impacting the overall approach to data privacy and how that could um, impact discussions around federal policy, as well as the trade-offs involved in the data privacy debate when it comes to issues such as innovation and speech. Great. Uh, well, thank you and welcome to you. Uh, Peter, nice to see you. Uh, tell us what you're up to these days. Well, I, I'm, as, you, as you mentioned, I'm the um, acting chief privacy officer at Justice Department. And just by way of background, the Justice Department includes most of the federal law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, the DEA, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, uh, marshals, and so forth, all the prosecutors, um, folks representing the government, the immigration judges, just a whole host, about 150,000 people if you include our contractors. Um, so my job is to basically make sure that everybody, I have two functions, one is, um, policy, I advise on new ideas about privacy, but I, um, and by the way, when it comes to affecting people's data, that's pretty much everything we do at the Justice Department. Um, but I also have the responsibility to make sure that the 150,000 employees and contractors that we have do what we say they're supposed to do, do what the law requires them to do, and that's a compliance responsibility. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, ultimately, privacy is, is about trust. And if you, if we, for instance, at the Department of Justice or a business, but if we don't do what we're required to do under the law, then we're going to lose the ability to get the information we need to keep people safe and to protect national security. So ultimately, trust is mission critical. And that's true not only for the Department of Justice, it's true for businesses that have to maintain the trust of their customers. And so um, what I've been doing on my policy side of the house is really trying to work uh, to um, 
to, to help figure out the best way to have laws that actually result in people doing what they're supposed to do so that, that, um, that we can maintain trust in, in the data that is, that is essential social resource that we all use and, and, and need to be both either efficient or protect public safety and all the other good things both government and private sector do with personal data. Great. Well, thank you uh, for, for that uh, intro and, and welcome to you. And uh, finally, most important, uh, since we, we started with least, as, as I was saying, uh, Jane, thanks for your patience. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, your work uh, in your, your dual roles, actually. Yeah. Yes, I'm a, I'm a law professor uh, at University of Arizona, and I got interested in privacy from a sort of strange angle. And I think it affects how I see the, the policy development. Uh, I, I started off seeing the unintended negative uh, effects of, pri of otherwise well-intentioned privacy laws on, uh, in terms of how it affected research and public accountability, things like FOIA's privacy exception. And so I started sort of narrowly trying to figure out uh, in my research and, and some of my um, pro bono work, trying to figure out how to, um, how to best mitigate the tension between um, the control over new knowledge that privacy um, embodies versus the liberty to create new knowledge and to use it that um, that free speech and other and, and other public values embody. Um, and then more recently, so, you know, I started sort of narrow on, on thinking about um, research, the impact of privacy laws on research. Um, at this point, um, I'm writing pretty actively about almost all areas of, of big data and, and, and privacy. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm also serving as the reporter for the Uniform Law Commission. Uh, their, um, their act, which, which just got approved um, at the annual meeting, and uh, that tries to craft a, an alternative to the sorts of legal proposals or enactments that we've seen in, in California and Virginia. Great, well, well thank you and congratulations on, on that, uh, that thoughtful input to the, to the whole dialogue. And um, hopefully we're gonna get into a bunch of the, the issues here. So um, let's start out by, uh, really diving in, you know, we'll, we'll ultimately wind up with uh, concrete, you know, predictions and where law and what bills and things might happen. But let's start off at the, at the highest level. Um, Peter started us already a little bit into it, but um, just what is privacy? You know, it, it, it's such a broad topic, Jane, you're writing about it and all kind, you know, never a shortage of things to write about. Marty's, Marty's had on his fourth decade of writing about it. Um, uh, you know, why don't, uh, uh, Jane, maybe you could go first here and just, just what, what is privacy? How, how should we be thinking about what we're solving here? Yeah, so it is quite an abstract concept. And one, one of the problems with privacy discourse is that it has the quality that it can be whatever people want it to be. And so sometimes we wind up talking past each other or not recognizing the trade-offs that have to be made. But I'd say, you know, at a high level, um, we want to recognize in legal form or norms, if, if necessary, some amount of control that people have in terms of their seclusion or the secrecy that they can expect or the downstream uses of, of information about them that describes them and that is about them. Um, so, so that's why I described it as a constraint on knowledge. And, and I know that that kind of puts it negatively, but it, it is useful to constrain what people do with information in a lot of contexts. Um, but the other reason I like that framing is that you can see the downsides too, that, um, that usually and um, historically, at least as far as um, courts have, uh, you know, for the most part, you have courts have interpreted American privacy, the default is sort of landed on the other side, that it, in general, um, people have liberty to use information in novel and creative ways, unless, unless there's some recognizable threat to some minimum level of seclusion or, um, or uh, some downstream harm that is predictable and, you know, not, uh, not too speculative. So that's how I would encapsulate it. <laughs> Marty? 
So it, when I think about privacy, the term privacy is, is used in the United States and much of the world. It really encompasses three interests. First is the interest to have a space where I'm not viewed, I'm, I'm not seen. A place uh, where in my house, unobserved by others. The second is the ability to control the knowledge about me, to you know, be able to define myself and not be defined by the body of information that is that flows around me. And the third and, and increasingly most important in an observational world is that the data is used in a fair fashion, um, that that data is used in a fashion that is um, that, that that if it's harmful, it's harmful in a lawful way. Um, and not in an capricious way. Um, it is interesting in the United States that the first privacy law enacted was the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is a fair processing piece of legislation um, that begins to describe with, with a, the, verily, the fairly abundant information collected for credit reporting that it be only be used for permissible purpose. And that's a fair processing piece of law so that it encompasses all three. In European law, as you as you know, Stu, we split the concept of of privacy as a matter of seclusion that's under a fundamental right to family life, and the other is the fundamental right to data protection, which encompasses all of the areas that are impacted by the by personal data. Great, thank you, uh, Marty. Um, Jennifer, let's bring you back into the discussion. Yeah, I was going to jump in and kind of pick up on some of what Marty and Jane have already said. If I think at least colloquially, it's incredibly important to discuss what we aren't talking about when we talk about data privacy. So oftentimes on, in the policy framework, we hear concerns about data breaches or data security issues, which are very important issues in data protection, but should be distinguished from the data privacy conversation, from things like what Jane and, and her colleagues are working on at the Uniform Law Commission. I also think it's important to distinguish between data privacy in the consumer privacy context, issues where we're talking about the consumer relationship to um, a company that may be collecting data or what sort of rights we perceive in those actions and kind of the privacy and the freedom from government surveillance sense, the concerns about what the context, what, what information the government may or may not have access to, questions of Fourth Amendment rights. Those are also privacy questions of a, of a certain sort, but they're handled very differently and the way many of us would view them are very different than kind of how we view this traditional consumer privacy question. Right, and thanks for, for distinguishing that. On the focus, which is I think gonna be our primary focus today on the consumer uh, privacy angle. Um, Peter, tell us anything else you wanna to add to what you had said earlier about generally what privacy is, but then maybe you could start us off on, on a, how do we start thinking about taking these broad concepts of rights and philosophy tied to them um, and boiling it down into stuff that's meaningful and actionable, both uh, to consumers, as we just discussed, and, and understandable by, by businesses. Well, thanks, Stu. Um, and again, I, I, since I'm from the government, I just wanted to highlight and, and reemphasize what Jennifer just suggested, which is um, in the United States, um, we have very strong privacy protections against the government reflected both in constitution and our statutes like the Privacy Act. Um, and, and part of that is because we know privacy is central to any democratic society. You know, people are in control of their government. There has to be some limit to the government's ability to control them. And so that's why we think people ought to have the right to be left alone. You know, freedom of thought requires privacy of thought. And that's a precondition of civil society and democracy. You know, everybody knows authoritarian states don't re respect privacy. We forget the crucial role of privacy rights in keeping democratic governments from becoming authoritarian. The difference, however, in the United States, privacy we think of as a fundamental right, but we believe it's about protecting mutual trust between government and the people in connection with a democratic society. You know, in a commercial sector, Americans don't typically consider data protection to be a fundamental human right but a means to promote mutual trust between individuals and organizations. And so 
that's really, as I, as you said, Stu, what we need to be focused on. And, and here there's a tremendous amount of confusion and misunderstanding that, that uh, Jane and, and uh, Marty and, you know, highlighted. And a part of that, I think, is that, you know, it, when information was mostly on paper, individuals could physically control the paper on which the information was contained. And so the law recognized the right of control in the paper as an individual's private property. Privacy became associated with that idea of control or property. But in a world of computerized data, particularly when computers connect to one another in networks, uh, unilateral individual control ceases to be possible. And so when the fair information practices that were discussed a little earlier were developed, and the principal two people who developed them was a fellow named Willis Ware and um, David Martin, um, they rejected the idea of privacy as a function of individual control, but they said it had to be an attribute of the relationship of trust between the individual and the organization. And that recognized that, that the organization and the individual both have a strong interest in the proper handling of the information about the data subjects, okay? So the FIPS, or the Fair Information Practices, constitute really a normative structure where both the individual and the organization have um, a strong interest in doing what's required. So it's about a mutual relationship or a mutual trust structure. Um, I like to talk about the Privacy Act as implementing the real idea under, and of course, before I do that, um, you know, the, 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 the European data protection context is, is at some level may recognize that, but, but as it's been interpreted, has been largely focused on this idea of privacy or, or data protection as a right of individual control. But when the Privacy Act implemented the original HEW report, which, which was where this idea of fair information, fair information practices came from, the, the act did not use a concept of individual control. It used a very strong but flexible concept of compatible use, requiring information to be used only in ways compatible with the purposes for which it was originally collected. No, no surprises, right? So for data that was not within a compatible use or otherwise specifically excluded by the act, prior written consent was needed or, or express written consent was needed from the individual. So that gave a lot of flexibility to government agencies to use uh, information as appropriate, consistent with compatible uses. Um, but it also prevented the act from over relying on individual consent, which if you rely on, if you require consent for everything, you turn the whole process into a meaningless checkbox process. So what, what you really want to do with a statute is have a, have a flexible process that can be complied with by organizations that are responsible for maintaining trust. And most organizations have an interest in using information appropriately because it's just as much in their interest as it is in the individual's interest. So, um, you know, the problem with the idea of ex ante individual control or consent isn't just you end up with checkbox consent problems, but, but you often end up in situations, as we have seen in Europe, where the compliance rates become just abysmally low. And, you know, small and medium sized businesses, the estimates is less than 10% of them are compliant. And really, that's most business. So, if less than 10% of those after three years are complying with the statute, that's one good way of losing trust, which is not doing what the law requires you to do. On the other hand, if you can comply with the law and build trust, then, then you know, you're, you're moving toward the goal, the ultimate goal of any privacy statute, which is to maintain trust between the organizations and the individuals, particularly in a consumer context. Great. Well, so thank Steve, you. Thank you for that. Um, go ahead, Marty. You can go ahead and respond. So, so, the, so the concept of compatible use um, is, is a very broad concept. 
um, and who interprets what is a compatible use and how do you interpret what's a compatible use and how do you demonstrate that your process for defining what is a compatible use is part of, um, of, of the conundrum that we face in terms of flexible privacy law. So Peter, I absolutely agree with you that flexibility is important, that trust is important, but there needs to be some mechanism um, for, for organizations to, 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 to demonstrate that what they're doing with data is in the context of the relationship between the organization and the individual. And, and that's where the concept of accountability comes into play because accountability is about the responsible and answerable use of data. And what that, and responsible means using data within the context of the relationship in a manner that takes the other stakeholders' interests into play. Answerable is about demonstrating to others that you've done that with competency and integrity. So, so the question is how do you build Based on you know Peter say, saying that that compatible uses is, is 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 a freeing mechanism. How do you build that in so that it's a trusting mechanism as well? Okay, yeah. well yeah, I'll quickly answer, but I think other people will want to respond. But I, Marty knows that the Privacy Act creates the flexibility through what are called routine uses, which are which are controlled or limited by compatible uses. So if an agency gets a little greedy in how they frame out their, their, um, their, their routine uses, courts can always determine that's not compatible, okay? So there's a court oversight structure in the Privacy Act, but there's also an administrative procedure you have to go through in order to be able to develop a compatible use or a routine use. But I'll defer to, I think Jane may have some ideas because the statute she's worked on heavily relies on that same kind of structure, but all in the commercial context. Yeah, so the ULC Act um, takes up this idea of compatible use, uh, but I'd say it actually, it, its definition of compatible use might sweep a little broader than the Privacy Act in the following sense, that it, it, it attempts, so first of all, let me explain that um, the, the benefit of recognizing a large swath of compatible uses is to minimize, is to limit the um, context in which you need to get user consent because consent is where there is this notion of control and it's expensive to comply with, but also it puts a lot of burdens on the end user themselves to figure out what the likely benefits and harms of any processing will be. Um, so, so the goal was to, to, to have a fairly broad um, context where a, a firm can feel confident that what they're doing is going to be seen as a compatible use. And there are two routes to um, showing or to, to proving that you're that what you're doing is compatible. One is the one that that Peter mentioned and that I think is um, most uh, most familiar from the Privacy Act, which is um, routine uses, something where um, a reasonable user, um, who's interested and, and concerned about in this area would have an expectation that their data is going to be used in this way, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, it's exactly the one and only purpose for which the data was originally collected, but it has come to become it has become routine. But the other method that I think is quite important, at least conceptually and, and probably practically as well, is if a use is novel and unexpected but it has clear benefits to the user, to the vast majority of users. Um, and I, I, think, I think that's quite important because uh, one of the downsides to a European style or user control um, uh, method for protecting user, uh, personal data um, is not only that consent is, is expensive, but it, it is a true innovation killer, right? There are, there are going to be beneficial, but initially strange repurposes of data that our entire internet economy has been built on to, to some extent. Um, and by the way, you know, by um, these, these privacy laws that, that we're contemplating in the US, that they're going to restrict, you know, American companies, but I, I'm still quite confident that um, China and other countries are going to be innovating big time in, in AI. So the real question, and, and once we see the, 
not, you know, the utility of these applications, we will definitely um, adopt them just as Europe adopted Facebook and other definitely privacy invasive uh, technologies that, that American companies developed. And so, and, and so this, the um, ULC bill um, tries to uh, ensure that, that a, a large amount of innovating can go forward without user consent as long as um, there is a reasonable basis to, you know, reasonable basis to believe that, that the user will uh, benef benefit from the, from the new use. So the accountability one, question is harder, though. Which one of the one of the challenges, and I'll come to you, Jennifer, uh, maybe on, on this one. But one of the challenges, uh, of course, as you start thinking about what's a routine use, a compatible use, or a consumer expectation, is not all consumers are created equally. They all have different views and different perspectives on on the approach and. Uh, which I think has been uh, in large part a challenge in enumerating, you know, some finite set of appropriate or inappropriate uses. Uh, and Jennifer, how do you how do you think about that? H how should uh, who should be making those determinations? Should it be uh, left to the business to figure it out and make the case? Should it be prescribed in some specific law or? Um, should it be, you know, uh, subject to a consent or consumer choice? So I think there are a couple of things at play there. I think first, as Jane mentioned in, in her comments, we can't ignore that there are beneficial uses to data. We can't just focus on the harms that may occur. We also have to recognize that there's a lot of benefits to a data-rich society that many of us enjoy, whether we're putting it in those terms or not. So when we're looking at when should privacy actually be regulated, oftentimes what we're going to look at is when is a harm actually occurring that we can all agree is a harm. So to the example that was given earlier with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, there's very easily cognizable harms that we can point to that most people would say that's information that needs to be regulated. When we look at other is history of privacy laws in the US, oftentimes they're dealing with these subsets where there is at least general agreement that even if there is a trade off to innovation or to speech, that the potential for harm or the actual harm is so real and so irreversible that we're willing to make those trade offs. The problem is that once you get past a few very specific things, we have a very wide range of preferences when it comes to what information we do and do not consider particularly sensitive. So you see this in people's individual express behavior, preferences when it comes to what social media sites they may use or what information they may give out about themselves. But you also see this just in terms of how we define different types of data. What we, for example, might define as health data can vary from individual to individual. So when we're looking at policies that may regulate those transactions, we really want to look at those places where there's a generally agreed upon harm and, not, and make sure that we aren't just going to the most privacy sensitive option all the time without weighing those potential trade-offs that may occur. There is an important role though for education, both for consumers to educate themselves to make sure that they are acting with those privacy preferences, as well as to look at where are places where we can help improve digital literacy, where we can help people understand what the ranges of preferences are and why they may or may not want to make certain choices. Thank you. It, I, I'm curious, maybe for any of you, um, if a consumer um, has a desire not to have information collected or used, uh, but it's been shown that the ability to collect or use that information uh, does benefit the consumer, should that choice exist? So the, the concept of knowledge creation is an incredibly important concept. That is really what drives innovation. And increasingly, as the nature of statistics has changed um, over the long period, uh, Stu, when you and I have been doing privacy, um, the fact is that, that the correlations that come with data help give us new concepts, new insights, generate new types of data based on what happens in, in that analytics. And the creation of knowledge is an area where there should be great liberalism and the fact is that when we come think about things like 
disease abatement and um, uh, and better education and um, even congestion, the ability to to congestion relief, the ability to do knowledge creation is incredibly important. Part of what the GDPR got wrong is it it precludes knowledge creation. Um, it has a fear of the term profiling. Um, it, it looks to the outcomes once you use that knowledge rather than looking at the creation of the knowledge itself. So the fact is you can structure privacy law so that it differentiates from the creation of the new knowledge and the application of the new knowledge. And part of what we need to do is think about privacy legislation that, that links the risk to individuals with the use. So the creation of new knowledge is one type of use. The application of that new knowledge to make decisions about, about people is another. And the, and the types of risks associated with them are different. And we need to have a way of differentiating that. So if I could jump in uh, and yeah, I please a fabulous conversation. Um, more generally, and I think the answer to the question, I think, is not just it's a good idea to use things for things that people might not have thought of or necessarily always agree with, but the the there's a difference between a subjective trust or a subjective concept of what the individual prefers or cares about and the objective question of what's appropriate in terms of uses, okay? So the individual control model that we've been talking about associated with the GDPR assumes is, is, is tied up with this idea of a subjective, uh, you know, a subjective determination about what is and what isn't, you know, an appropriate use. Um, but in fact, we all know that, that an appropriate use is what we as a society, uh, or at least all the stakeholders who are in that community determine is appropriate or not appropriate. The individual control model ends up assuming a, a, an adverse relationship between the organization and the individual. And, and that means that privacy governance, you, you run into this social trap um, that, that absent some form of intervention by the state, either an administrative agency or a court, the underlying resource, that is the personal data, is gonna get overused or misused or destroyed but in connection with privacy governance, this narrative, this tragedy to the commons narrative is misleading. You know, it's important that there are a lot of connections with the environmental world. And, and famously, the economist Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for refuting the conventional wisdom that state intervention was needed to prevent what we call the tragedy of the commons, um, that, that what she recognized was and, and, and won the Nobel Prize for is that common pool resources, and she focused primarily on environmental resources, but also public resources like law enforcement. Um, and likewise, in the digital world, these common pool resources consist, you know, personal data in which two or more stakeholders have a legitimate interest. And what she discovered is that you can actually have humans get together without state intervention to develop effective rules to manage these resources. And when these, these self-regulating structures are in place, the compliance rates are very high. They have high rates of buy-in, uh, the enforcement rates are low, and the guidance is generally clear. You get high levels of social trust. And then she also recognized is that you know, and of course, state, the state needs to recognize these things, but if you try to control them by the state, you'll destroy them. Well, you see a lot of these kinds of structures um, reflected in effective um, governance structures. And interestingly, David Martin, one of the authors of the FIPS, was the actual designer of the Cape Cod National, Resor Cape Cod National Seashore. Where, which was a predecessor of a lot of these environmental laws. So that, that these multi-stakeholder organization structures are actually structures and vehicles that can actually um, provide high levels of flexibility, high levels of, of mutual control by the stakeholders, but 
no individualized control um, so that all this, everyone gets what they need, but nobody necessarily gets everything they want. So in general, you, ideally you wanna have a privacy law that facilitates these types of structures that can be designed for particular contexts and imply general principles that the statute would have, can be overseen by an agency or a court, but effectively allow flexibility, allow structures of trust building, but don't try to say that any individual gets to determine or have the final say over what can and can't be done with quote, that individual's data. Thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, very, very thoughtful, good historical context. Uh, anyone want to respond to Peter before I move on to another question? Just one quick point. The, the, the general data protection regulation actually talks about process, the data must be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. It is, it is the interpretation of the permissions that are that are in in in, in there that have become um, that have have driven GDPR to be almost completely consent based. It wasn't. It, it, it isn't the nature of the theory behind it. It was the actual application, and I think that's that's important. Um, we tend to run to this concept of individual control when we think organizations are irresponsible in deciding what is lawful and fair. And, and, and I just wanted to add that to-, to, to Yeah, Peter's. thanks, Marty. I'll maybe take a, I'll chime in with a comment, even though I'm moderating a, a, a specific on this, but you know, the, the, I think both Peter's point and Marty's follow-up, there's an effort I've been working on um, called Privacy for America. And we've, we've developed a, you know, a model similar to, uh, uh, in, in, in a model way that the others on this uh, panel have done. But one of the things we really were focusing on there, and, and I think it goes to what Peter was describing, is to try and get away from that interpretation found in the GDPR, uh, which we kind of call the old paradigm, which is just transparency and choice, and move it much more towards what Peter was describing as, as appropriate uses and kind of normative standards that are evaluating benefit to society. Uh, and so it's interesting because the two models seems to be, you know, I, if you bookend them, um, you know, there seems to be this back and forth about, you know, which, what should be the model? Is there some way of doing both? And you see them kind of almost, uh, there's a tension um, that I see developing about uh, around them. So it's interesting. So let me take that and turn to the question um, and get in a little bit to the, um, have the state and federal models, we've talked about the GDPR, some of the, the Uniform Commission, Marty, you've got a framework, all of you have worked a lot on, on frameworks. Um, what's working? You know, what, what model should, should be the, the model in the United States? Before we do that, can I say some, a little something about the, the range of appropriate uses? And, and yeah, please. Um, so in, in principle, I, I agree with every, uh, the, the consensus that seems to be here that, um, that uh, regulation should be trying to foster appropriate uses and, and trying to disincentivize or reduce inappropriate uses. Um, and, and the ULC draft does that. It, it carves out this zone where it's not clear that there are gonna be benefits. And so therefore that's the area where there is, where consent is relevant. Now I'm gonna take off that hat though for a second to argue against going too far in that direction too quickly, uh, because that question still will, will tend to allow, um, you know, tend to import um, general anxieties about new technology that appear generation after generation. And so if anything, there might need to be a thumb on the scale in terms of allowing even some what temporarily looks like inappropriate use in order to see what actually happens. And, and to give a, a historical example, uh, well, or maybe both a modern and historical perspective, um, right now, I think I think the there's a there's a consensus uh, that facial recognition is a technology that should just be off the table. That's just inappropriate, or at least in many of the of the contexts in which it's used right now. Um, 
But that I worry about a, a consensus building around even that position as unpopular as as my questioning it, the, the orthodoxy is going to be, uh, because, uh, you know, a hundred years ago when, or more than a hundred years ago, when Brandeis and Warren were writing about the right to privacy, the core technology that drove them to write that article was the handheld camera. And, and almost all of the arguments you hear about why facial recognition is so inappropriate can be can be used just as effectively with just you know changing out a few words to describe the innovation of the camera, and so uh, and, and so I, I think that we are I think that we need to start thinking about what fairness means in a data rich environment, and I applaud uh, Marty and every everyone here for starting to think through that, but I am not sure it where it's entirely ripe. Um, we, it isn't. I, I think that's a really astute point. And isn't I kind of jokingly call that, uh, you know, I, I critically sometimes say, oh, we've got to appease the Luddites, right? Um, <laughs> it, isn't the challenge, though, exactly where Peter started, which is if you don't have that trust within the system of what the standards are, then the standards don't carry any weight. So it, 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 there are international examples that actually are interesting um, they might be you know, off. Uh, they, they might not be the ones we look at. Um, Singapore recently revised their privacy law um, to really liberalize the ability to do knowledge creation, to think with data. And that was an intentional um, development. But before they actually developed um, the, the, the um, exemptions from consent um, that, are, that are the basis for those changes in law, they actually push this concept of what does it mean to be a responsible organization, and then they and 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 they 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 limited the use of this really flexible use of data for knowledge creation, not based on consent, but based on an assessment of the benefits to individuals as well as the risks to individuals. They base that on organizations having processes in place that could be overseen in an effective manner. So the, 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 if you don't have something that gives some framework and substance and, and, and control, th then you have this, this risk that, that, that crazy people will do crazy things with data, not just the thinking of the new ideas, but actually applying it, for example, um, facial recognition in the inappropriate way. Those of us have gotten on, onto an international flight and have been validated by our face to get onto that international flight. I know we haven't been doing international flights lately, but to get on the plane, understand that facial recognition in that application makes a great deal of sense. You can't make you know, these blanket things that technology is bad. You've got to have these means for, 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 for distinguishing where they're right and where they're wrong. And you need a, a, a mechanism that does that in a trustful fashion. But I think to Jane's point, we've seen these techno panics evolve over time. If you want to go more recent than the camera, it was caller ID was going to ruin privacy. And so the question is, when is actual regulation needed versus when can we kind of allow those norms in society to develop and allow some of that panic to perhaps subside as we see the beneficial uses is like being able to get on a plane without having to scan your and let me just yeah. real quickly if i don't if you don't mind um because obviously the fbi developed some of the more i mean and this is public um the uses of facial recognition technology in connection with the old mug shots where they're using facial recognition when they have a suspect for kidnapping a kid or, or committing a murder. They don't know who the suspect is. They run it against the existing mug shot list. Uh, generally speaking, they've got a whole lot of controls and protections to make sure that that's not gonna get misused. Those are not the typical examples that people are concerned about when they're talking about you know the, 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 the the risks of, of facial recognition technology. Um, so obviously I agree with everyone that we have to be careful before we ban a whole technology. Um, and and we, we've often argued for the appropriate use of facial recognition technology by governments, 
But at the same time, we work, we, we work, I work in a country, in a, in, a, in a government that's elected by the people. And at some point, the people get to decide these kinds of questions about, about how certain types of, of technology can and can't be used, particularly by their governments, where we don't have First Amendment rights to complain, you know, that might limit what, 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 what the law can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis what private sector does. And, and so it's always important to keep in mind there is a diet, you know, it, the, the solution is we gotta educate people enough so that, so that appropriate uses can be allowed both by the government and by the private sector. And, and at the same time, recognize some deference to the fact that the legislatures can get it wrong sometimes because that's why, <laughs> why they're democracy. Yeah, or so, maybe, and maybe, maybe an example very quickly of, of, a, of, a, of a sort of use restriction that we're quite accustomed to is, is anti-discrimination law, which you know, Title VII can be thought of as a data governance law. It, it, it disallows certain uses of information that a company might have at their disposal, but cannot use to make certain determinations. Um, but that's an example of, of something where a problem emerged and then a discrete solution was crafted. And so I guess an open question is whether it's better to let law lag and see where we go and, and, then, and then play whack-a-mole <laughs> or, or whether there are some principles that we feel so confident are going to apply long term that we can do the sort of di division of, of good and bad uses in advance. Yeah, so that that is the question, you know, from from my uh, perspective, um, you know, I think things were working pretty well. You had statutes that had been passed, you know, over many years where there had been real threats or harms and the Internet was booming. Um, and uh, we had good self-regulation along the lines of what uh, Peter was describing uh, built in. And um, and now, you know, we're seeing in the U.S., um, you know, I think we've got three or four state laws this year, another one a year or two ago. Um, and uh, so what's working? What should we do? We're now at a stage where we're starting to get some conflicting laws. We're not even clear what approach we have. We're not clear who gets to write the laws. Uh, some real estate developers in California think it's them. Uh, we each think it's us in our own way. I say that jokingly, same about the real estate developer, but... Uh, the Congress certainly, uh, you know, is a, is a channel. But so what do you all think? What should we be doing? Can I jump in before everyone? I just wanted to highlight the difference between a general data protection or a comprehensive data protection law and a sectoral law. And just for the audience, we have laws like HIPAA. We've got Gramley-Fliley. We've got, you know, they're probably, I mean, they're just probably over two or 300 um, state and federal privacy laws that govern particular sectors. And nobody is complaining very much about the protection that's taking place within those sectors. So uh, it's always helpful to keep in mind that what are we asking about a law that's gonna just take care of everything and replace all these sectoral laws that nobody's complaining about? Or are we talking about filling in the gaps where there has been a breakdown in trust? That's sort of the question I would sort of frame up. Good, good. I like it, Marty. And then Jennifer. So, so, so I recently had a conversation with a, with a senior European official in private. And I said, one of the things that happened with the GDPR is that there was a decision it would be risk-based legislation, but nobody ever discussed risk of what. And so you've, you've got legislation that um, on the part of European regulators is risk that individuals won't be able to exercise their rights to object, for example, to flexible uses of data. And, and while the business community thought it was risk of real tangible harm and, and whoops, we got it wrong. We passed the legislation that's risk-based and we never asked that question of risk of what. At, at the IAF, the organization I run, this is one of the basic questions we think has Marty, to be Marty, just answered. to be clear, it wasn't we who got it wrong, it was they who got it wrong. Well, put, put, put this way, the collective community of mankind that was interested in, in the European law, they, 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 they got it wrong. So, so the fact is that um, in California, I don't think there was this question of risk of what. I can tell you based on the, what I've read in the Virginia law, 
there wasn't that question of risk of what. There's a requirement that you do risk assessments, but it never defines risk of what you're doing risk assessments for. So, and I think a really important exercise is, is, is defining risk of what. And the IAF model legislation, the Fair and Open Use Act, we started with this question of what are the risks that we're trying to confront in term and it and and it's and it's and it's and it's it's negative outcomes of using and not using data. It's both ways. It's it's, it's both the decision not to as well as the use to use data. And we begin to describe mechanisms for assessing the levels of risk. So I I, I so you know I will tell you and we're going to do a program in Washington D.C. We're going to come at, we're going to have people begin to debate this concept of risk of what because I think it's a basic piece to not making the mistake that was made in Europe where they created a law that is quote risk-based and there was no agreement on what risk-based means. And I'll be quiet. So I want to jump in on the state-by-state approach and some of the risk um, associated with that kind of patchwork that is starting to emerge. Um, So California, of course, kind of had the first mover and as a large state with many tech companies in it, I think that there was this sense that in some ways CCPA, now CPRA, has become de facto federal law. And the question is, what does that mean for those of us who don't live in California, who may have different privacy preferences? um, And what does that mean with several elements of this law that were not fully interpreted at the time that the law became effective and now that you've had further dramatic changes of it. Then you start to have other states pass these laws, Virginia being the most notable one this term that has a different model than CCPA, Um, but you've also seen states like Nevada, past one, Maine um, has a a different one involving primarily ISP related issues, but you start to have this patchwork emerge that can create confusion, not only for businesses that are trying to comply, but also for consumers about what their rights are and what risk that what's considered risk um, or what's considered improper use. I do think it's interesting when we consider, say, the the Uniform Law Commission approach or this kind of question of what if everyone just passed their own version of CCPA, would that be better that, you know, to have a, a 50 states with their own individual law, but it looks almost identical or a federal law. And if you have 50 states, even with their own identical law, you're certainly going to get different interpretations by attorneys general over some often very key terms to consumers and to companies trying to comply. And what does that mean as opposed to a federal law, let alone if you have 50 states with 50 different laws, some of which are inevitably going to conflict with one another. Yeah, it's interesting that the collection of uh, online data in in particular, you've got uh, two laws in Europe, the GDPR uh, and the e-privacy directive. You've got the various laws, including this new privacy control that uh, was self-created outside of the statute in the CCPA, which will be taken away by the CPRA. You also have the Apple law, their standards. You've got the Google standards. Uh, so how is a company to comply and what's a consumer, you know, what's happening here? Yeah, well, uh, so in terms of how the company must comply, I, I mean, companies are going to have to to comply with the intersection of all the strongest laws in which they operate. And, and, and um, the UCL, the Uniform Law Commission, by the way, we did not take it on ourselves to have uniformity across the state as our main goal. Instead, we, we, we favored interoperability so that if you're already complying with California, you will automatically be um, found compliant with this law that we put forward. But I, I agree with you, Jennifer, that ideally, we would have a federal law that is a gap filling law between the um, where for the sectors that are not already uh, that are not already um, that don't already have their own federal law like HIPAA. Um, and it would be different from GDPR. It would be the global model that is workable and that um, that reduces risks of harm, you know, um, concrete harm, as, as Marty uh, referred to. Um, 
And, and it winds up not looking very much like California's law, which, which I, uh, you know, at least I think could, could not possibly survive a, a First Amendment challenge when they inevitably come. I totally agree. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, um, you're also about to see, um, you know, as clients ask me, you know, how do we comply? You know, what, what, what should we follow? What's going to happen? My, my kind of constant refrain is, it's going to get a lot murkier before it gets cleaner uh, <laughs> because you're going to see even more and more of the d different state and different approaches. I, I, I thought I'd mention and see if anyone has any thoughts on this, but it appears the FTC is also picking up its pen now or, or picking up a pen that probably they don't even have authority of, uh, but to, to dive in, you know, you, you read the tea leaves through the executive order and some of the, changes of the new chairwoman there. But, I, you know, as I read it, they're about to write a privacy regulation, um, which wouldn't be preemptive uh, because the statute's not preemptive of which they, they tie it into. So I'm curious, um, how's that going to play? Any thoughts? So it, it, we've had an unfairness. First of all, I'm not a lawyer, Stu, as you know. So opining on legal you know more processes. Than most lawyers I know, Marty. So it's probably inappropriate, but the fact is that we have had an unfairness standard in the United States, and we've thought a lot about that unfairness standard. Um, there is there is uh, a, a, a um, there is a concept of fairness that exists in other jurisdictions, and um, and I'm not quite sure how the Federal Trade Commission moves from what is an established unfairness um, uh, concept under Section Five to a general concept of fairness that you have to you have to provide fairness and describing what that would be so as a non-lawyer i just don't see how you make that that jump and we've had this discussion about going from an unfairness standard to a fairness standard for 25 years too and 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 the and, and the reasons we haven't made it so maybe i'm a little bit of a uh, so as a, a legal matter i totally I totally agree with you. I'm just reading the tea leaves and telling you, I think you're going to see a proposal that that's deeper than all the ones we've written combined. That's my prediction. You heard it here first. Well, Peter, it would be really interesting. If, if that <laughs> happens, though, it's going to be interesting because another, you know, another goal of the FTC is to promote competition. And the more complex the concept of fairness is, the less competition we're going to get when, you know, only Google and Apple can comply um, and Amazon, I suppose. So, so I don't know how they're going to responsibly manage those those yeah. two goals that can be in tension. You know, we're, if I, I can I, jump in here, I, you know, yeah. I would, similar to what Jane was saying, I think we also have to discuss this intersection that often occurs of when you have very complex data protection and privacy rules, it is the largest players who are often able to comply with them. The cost of compliance, the burdens of compliance on smaller players, on innovative startups is and can be incredible, particularly when you're looking at something like California's law or like GDPR, not to mention non-tech companies that are often subject to these requirements. I also think when we're talking about the FTC's role in this, it's important to look at the ways that the current system has worked. The FTC has been an enforcer on data privacy issues when there has been consumer harm involved. And so we need to look at that question of, of you know, if we continue to focus on what consumers experience and on those cases when there is actual consumer harm, there has been advantages to this permissionless approach that allows these new innovative um, companies to get started without a lot of regulatory red tape and potentially challenge existing giants. If I could jump in just real quickly, um, I, I want to see two points. I, I agree with everything everyone has said. I want to focus on a, just the sort of experience in Europe for a second. And um, one of the things I've observed is that when you actually look at the difference between law and the books, at least the books in Brussels, and law on the ground as it's enforced in the member states, you end up seeing what's effectively a sectoral system as well, okay? Um, because it's ultimately going to be, you know, the law is going to be complied with in where there's any reasonable chance it's going to get enforced. And for small and medium-sized businesses in Europe, it's not going to be enforced. Um, now, 
and you can see, I mean, some of the data protection authorities, the Camille in France, uh, uh, um, Helen Dixon in Ireland, um, Liz Denon in England, will actually list what they're going to enforce, their priorities. And you look at the Camille, it says, well, we're going to do healthcare, we're going to do finance, and we're going to do employment, and they're all going to do cookies. Okay. Well, there you are. Um, now, the, the danger with this approach, and of course, the reason they do that is that they go to the legislature, they go to their parliaments, and they have a conversation about what the priorities are going to be and how much money they're going to get, and the parliaments are going to appropriate what they want, want them to enforce, okay? Um, now, in some European member states, my budget at the Department of Justice as the privacy officer is bigger than the data protection authorities' budgets in many of the member states in Europe. So you can get a, get a you know, and I, I will not tell you we're 100% compliant, but we're working on it. But, but, but the challenges of dealing with six or 700 systems versus millions of systems, you can sort of see the real compliance you're going to see there. That's fine. You know, you can have a sectoral system based on pure administrative discretion, but that's really highly problematic in a democracy. And it's highly problematic in, in a country like the United States where we, we generally expect laws enacted by democratic legislatures to have a tendency to be enforced. So yeah, and I'm only, you know, I'm sort of repeating what everyone is saying, but you know, it, you, know you cannot look at a, a statute like the GDPR and say it's a comprehensive privacy law. It's not, but the reason everyone, you know, it creates the illusion of one, but the reality is it's sectoral and the reality of any comprehensive privacy on the United States is going to be sectoral to some extent, but we'd like the law to reflect that it's not going to be a one size fits all solution. Otherwise, you're going to have this kind of situation where it's kind of like a social trap. Nobody actually believes in the law and it undermines not only the rule of law, but trust more widely in the, in, in the government and, and social society. Yeah, you know, Peter raises a, a, a general problem with law, which is that when it is too aspirational and too um, too harsh, then it becomes a law of discretion, and everyone's trying to read the tea leaves to figure out how it's going to be interpreted and enforced. And um, so, one you know, another way of putting that though is that I think a a um, a feature of a workable privacy law is one that has a process that allows for safe harbors to emerge as we learn what how technology works and what its impact is. And so I guess that, that you know the silver lining to the FTC maybe wanting to get more involved is that they might they they would be a, a good regulatory board for developing safe harbors if that's if that's the kind of you know notice of of the features of, of data processing that are per se legal. Um, the, the ULC draft has a process too for, uh, for sort of stakeholder engagement uh, based um, voluntary consensus standards to, to be proposed and then, and then eventually adopted. Um, and so, uh, so, so maybe, you know, tying all these threads together, um, it may be that what we need for functionality is not only at least some clear examples of forbidden processing, but also some nice clean examples of data processing that maybe we didn't think of initially, but that we now recognize as, as, as um, safe enough. Yeah, interesting. You know, outside of the question of legal authority, I, I kind of uh, share what I think I heard, like the FTC would be, a, a, particularly at the staff level, where they really do know this stuff in and out, would be a, a, a thoughtful organization to write rules the challenge, though, is if you can keep it from being politicized, because th the way I'm reading it, it's basically like, you know, a, a senator deciding by themselves, here's what I'm going to do and here's going to be the law. Um, and that's not going to that, that dog's just not going to hunt. You know, they're going to learn quickly. There's three branches of government. Uh, but that's just my side editorial. Uh, oh, and I Jennifer, think on that note. I, I say I think on that note, it depends on what exactly we're talking about the FTC potentially doing. Are we talking about the FTC right now with their current authority deciding to 
issue a completely new set of privacy guidelines? Or are we talking about a situation where in developing a federal data privacy bill, the Congress delegates certain elements of that bill to the FTC in their capacity as a consumer protection organization and given their experience and expertise with enforcing other existing data law. So here's a, here's my here's my prediction, which is uh, I don't think it'll come from I, I think it'll come before Congress would act, but I think it'll be similar. And this may be attractive to some people, but when the do not call and telemarketing legislation were rolled out, it was, you know, 60 pages of regulation without authority. And the courts found that that it had no authority. Uh, and then the Congress gave them the authority after the fact. Um, but to me, I think that's what you're going to see. I think you're going to see uh, a, a, a very progressive uh, as if it were, you know, a, a, a any of your favorite progressive senators, some who I love and I love their ideas. So I don't mean any of it as critique. It might actually be a, a very healthy thing for the country, but I, I think it's something should be on people's radar as I'm starting to, to, to read tea leaves here. Uh, so, and Marty, of course then- I'm oh, sorry, Jennifer, sorry. go ahead, finish and then Marty. I was gonna say, and of course then there, there gets to be some very interesting administrative law questions that, that are beyond the, the scope of this panel. Yeah, to totally agree. Yep, Marty. So, so, so let, let's let's go to some of the things that are going to happen. We're going to have a greater emergence of artificial intelligence in the United States. It's it's just going to happen. Um, we're going to spend more time bringing data together to think about the insights that that data gives us. That's going to happen. Um, what 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 is what is important is to make sure that we have some, 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 some boundaries in which that can emerge in a thoughtful way where the, where the negative impacts are thought through by parties and can be overseen by a responsible regulator and overseer. Putting the FTC in the position of making law because we don't have law to me is, 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 is not the most productive way of doing it. Um, and and being afraid of data being created, being being allowed to, uh, to to give us new insights, which I can't predict what those insights are going to be, is is also not not great. You know, we, we talked about oh we've got we've 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 got sectoral law that's worked well. Well, the HIPAA has precluded a lots of health related research that would have been very useful because of the way it was structured and interpreted. So the, the, the fact is we need a mechanism that allows for, for the making our lives better with data to emerge. Yeah, there are going to be some negative consequences. There are going to things where there are things they're going to think about stupid, but we need some boundaries to let that emerge in a thoughtful way. And that's what I'm suggesting privacy law should do is create the boundaries for us to think with data, to create new insights, to allow innovation to occur, and to do that in a way that has boundaries overseen in an effective way. The FTC has 40 to 60 people doing privacy rights, Stu. It's, 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 it's tiny compared to, to the number of people at the ICO, ICO who are doing privacy, probably 500 or so doing it. That's not a prescription for an effective oversight agency and giving them, you know, and, and just experimenting. I, I just think we need to have some structure for that to emerge. Of course, you know, if any of these, uh, uh, you know, if the new budget gets passed, they may they may rival the ICO uh, fairly soon. So we're at uh, about five minutes left. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to give each of you a minute or so plus to um Add anything else, where do you see the world going? But to just kind of tie some of your thoughts uh, in a knot, kind of have a final thought here. I'll, I'll probably have one last thought to tie it up at the end, but I'll start with one now. I would delegate to the four of you, I'll probably try and chime in too to pass the law. You all could write it, it'll be good. I, I think we'd be in good shape. We'll take your products. Uh, Peter, why don't we start with you? Well, I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to say. Um, I guess the, the key issue for me is if you're gonna enact a law, is it something that, that, that the regulated community can actually comply with? If, it, if it's not, stop. 
and do something else. Because if they can't afford to comply with it, they won't comply with it. And then you're going to be just playing the kind of games they're playing in Europe, which frankly, I think, result in a loss of social trust. The, the key here is to come up with a structure, a legal structure where the business community, which is going to be asked to comply with these, with these laws, it has, has to be able to afford to comply with them. And, and, and that is the first question because you know, how, the, how you get there, but, but today with the possible exception of the Uniform Law Commission stretch, st a statute, which, which seems to be a much lower cost vehicle, I'm not sure I've really seen, or, or sector specific structures, like Stu, the, 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 the Privacy for America thing that the, that the largely advertising folks put together, which is sector specific. Right. But, but you know, within a sector, you can actually design these things that are detailed and specific, and you can afford them because everyone in the sector knows what the rules are. But if you're going to have a comprehensive law, you can't do that level of granularity. You know, the Uniform Law Commission has the, the general rules and then it allows the voluntary consensus standards to develop the, the, the sector specific structures that would be more specific. But, but absent that kind of iterative process between the sectoral, process, sectoral specific process and the general rules, um, I don't see any other alternatives to something that's affordable. And without something that's affordable, you're gonna have a privacy law that destroys trust because then all the people that are supposed to be complying with the law won't be able to afford to comply with it except the large companies like Microsoft who already you know, have, have built into that, that, that structure and it's just gonna result in anti-competitive advantages for the big guys against the little guys. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, Jane? Yeah, so let's see. I, I, I think the features that we should be striving for, um, well, well. so, so, so first of all, on, on Mar Marty's last parting thoughts or the, the last set of thoughts, uh, I see the First Amendment as, as being the backdrop uh, along which we should we should we should train our, our privacy laws. And if, if you if you adopt that vision, then there's already strong protection for knowledge creation and there's a requirement that whatever law uh, be enacted be fairly narrowly targeted to a concrete harm. And, and that's great. It's just it's a it's a if if we can comply with the requirements of the First Amendment, then it's going to be a pretty good privacy law because it, what it should be doing is prohibiting or restricting to consent procedures the risk risky things that cause concrete harm. And then outside of that, um, uh, outside of that, I, I think that the old system that everyone hates right now actually functions pretty well. The old system being transparency for consumers with a basically a take it or leave it deal. Um, and uh, I, I know that it, it seems like it's not in consumers' interest because if they don't want tracking and behavioral advertising, um, it's very difficult to avoid that. But at the same time, if consumers really understood how much of the World Wide Web and the parts of it that they actually like the most, how much of them depend on behavioral advertising and the bump in, in, in revenues that they get from it, uh, you know, if we could see the alternative universe where there really isn't behavioral advertising, it's not clear that consumers actually want what, what it seems at least superficially that they want today. So, um, so I'm comfortable <laughs> saying that we should be looking for, um, looking for, for relatively narrow ways to prevent concrete harm. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. I want to echo a lot of what Jane just said, and I feel like that's something we haven't really gotten to dive into in this particular panel, that when discussing privacy, it's so important. 
are these points of friction and the trade-offs involved with privacy. It's, you know, privacy is one of those things kind of like puppies. Everyone's for it. No one, you know, very few people will, will just be like, I'm an anti-privacy person. Um, but, but when you actually boil down to it, there are a lot of points of friction, whether it's questions about the right to be forgotten and how that can impact freedom of the press and free speech, whether it's questions about data as speech and the First Amendment, whether it's all questions about the impact on innovation or smaller companies and competition, I think we can't just say privacy is good and therefore privacy should always be our North Star. We've got to very carefully examine those trade-offs and really take them into account in any potential privacy policy we may be considering. Great, thank you, Marty. We're at time, but why don't you have the last say? So, so the fact is that recital four of the GDPR says that it's all about the full range of rights and interests of people. And they just ignored that when they wrote the rest of the law. And, um, and, and I think that we all have an agreement on one thing that's very important is knowledge creation is where innovation comes from. And that we need to have privacy law that is protective of people, but allows the free expression that comes from combining data in interesting ways to come up with new insights. Great last word. I think we can all agree to that. Thank you all. This has been a terrific panel. Please join me in thanking uh, our great panelists and let's do this again. It was fun. <laughs>